It was supposed to be just another training flight, two veteran pilots, both instructors in one of the safest helicopters ever built. But within seconds of practicing a maneuver, they'd probably demonstrated a hundred times before the Bell 429 shattered midair and rained down across a field in Elba, New York. So how does something like that even happen? How could two people with over 8,000 combined hours lose control of a modern twin-engine helicopter? Well, the answer isn't mechanical, and it's not weather. It's something much deeper, a misunderstood aerodynamic trap called vortex ring state, and how training itself can become the biggest risk of all. On April 26, 2022, skies were clear over western New York. This wasn't an emergency response or a rescue call. It was recurrent training. Mercy Flights Bell 429, tail number November 507, Tango. Juliet lifted off from Genesee County Airport for what should have been a textbook session practice maneuvers, engine out drills, and precision control work. At the controls were two incredibly seasoned pilots. On one side, Jim Sauer, 60 years old. A former Army National Guard and New York State Police pilot, a guy with a rock-solid reputation. Calm, disciplined, dependable. He'd joined Mercy Flight two years earlier, flying some of the toughest missions in bad weather and tight terrain. And next to him, Stuart Dietrich, also 60, a Bell Helicopter Factory instructor from Texas. His job that day was to make sure Mercy Flight's pilots stayed sharp to keep them trained to factory standards. Between them, over 8,000 flight hours in the logbook. These weren't beginners, not even close. That's what makes this so hard to process. This wasn't some reckless stunt or bad weather gamble. This was supposed to make flying safer, but within minutes that safety exercise would turn into a catastrophic failure that not even two experts could survive. Now here's where things start to get really interesting and honestly a bit unsettling. Earlier that same morning before the crash, another Mercy flight pilot had flown with the same instructor Dietrich in the same helicopter. And what he told investigators later was shocking. During his flight, the instructor asked him to intentionally enter a vortex ring state, a condition every helicopter pilot is taught to avoid. And as the helicopter started sinking fast, the instructor just sat there. Hands on his lap, the pilot said. No input, no correction. Eventually, the student, uncomfortable and confused, took control and recovered on his own. Fast forward a couple of hours to the second flight of the day, the accident flight. Sauer and Dietrich took off again for more training. They practiced engine failures, auto rotations, even single engine landings. Everything seemed normal. Then just before 1 p.m., the data recorder showed the Bell 429 entered the VRS envelope again descending between 800 and 1300 feet per minute with low forward airspeed. In those final seconds, the helicopter's controls went wild, the cyclic was pushed forward, then yanked almost full aft within one second. The collective slammed all the way down, left pedal increasing. That combination is extremely aggressive and totally inconsistent with any proper recovery technique. It sent aerodynamic loads surging through the rotor system and the blades flexed downward hard enough to slice through the tail boom. Witnesses on the ground described the helicopter as almost stationary then falling apart mid-air. One person heard three loud cracks the sound of the main rotor blades striking the fuselage before the wreckage came crashing down over a two 500 foot debris field. It's chilling because by all accounts, this wasn't a loss of control caused by weather or failure. It was caused by the very people meant to demonstrate control. To understand what went wrong, we've got to talk about vortex ring state or settling with power, one of the most deceptive traps in helicopter flight. Picture this, you're descending straight down, maybe a little too steep, and your forward airspeed drops close to zero. The rotor is still spinning, still pulling air down, but now that air curls back up around the blades forming a circulating vortex. The helicopter starts to fall through its own downwash. You can be at full power engines screaming, but you're still sinking like a stone. And that's what makes VRS so dangerous. It feels like the machine is betraying you when in reality it's just physics. You're trapped in a column of turbulent air that you created. The proper recovery depends on training and instinct. Traditionally, you lower the collective and push the cyclic forward to get clean airflow through the rotor. But there's also a newer, more complex method called the Vuichard Recovery Increase Collective Apply Opposite Pedal and Bank Slightly Sideways to slide out of your own vortex. It's fast, but it's tricky, and if you mix up those control inputs, especially under stress, you can make things way worse. And that's exactly the kind of confusion investigators believe might have happened here. Instead of stabilizing the descent, the abrupt opposite control movements 
likely pushed the helicopter deeper into aerodynamic overload until physics did what physics always does. But here's the thing that wasn't the biggest mistake. Don't get me wrong, the control inputs were extreme, but the real issue was the training mindset behind them. Because this wasn't just about a pilot reacting wrong, it was about an instructor pushing a maneuver that probably never should have been demonstrated that low to begin with. Now here's where things get really frustrating because there was nothing wrong with this helicopter. The NTSB made it clear both engines were healthy hydraulics, fine controls continuous, no stuck linkages, no hidden cracks, no system failure. This accident was entirely pilot-induced. Investigators believe the instructor Dietrich likely directed the maneuver telling Sauer to enter VRS intentionally, but what they couldn't find was any evidence of how that exercise was briefed. There was no record of who had control, what the recovery plan was, or how they'd handle things if the descent got too steep. And that's a huge problem, because when you've got two highly qualified pilots at the controls, both instructors that authority gradient gets dangerously thin. Who's in command? Who's monitoring? In those final seconds, the flight data shows control inputs going in opposite directions. It's possible both men were acting, one trying to recover, the other trying to demonstrate. That's not teamwork, that's confusion. And confusion at 1,000 feet per minute is a death sentence. And here's the thing that really makes your blood boil. This wasn't some sudden, unpredictable moment. The morning flight already showed the warning signs. Another pilot literally told investigators the instructor sat there with his hands on his lap while the helicopter sank deep into VRS. That is not teaching, that's testing fate. It speaks to a deeper, risky training philosophy one, where instructors chase realism at the expense of safety margins. And it raises a fair question, should VRS ever be trained in a real helicopter anymore? Many operators don't think so. More and more are switching to simulator-based training, or they'll only demonstrate it at altitude where there's room to recover. Because the reality is, at low altitude, by the time you realize you're in a fully developed vortex ring, it's already too late. The lesson here, you can't teach recovery by deliberately flying into danger and hoping to climb back out. That's not instruction that's gambling with a million dollar aircraft and two human lives. Now let's talk about the helicopter itself, the Bell 429. It's one of the most advanced light twins on the market. Dual engines, redundant hydraulics, digital flight data recorders, stability augmentation systems, you name it. It's the helicopter equivalent of a luxury SUV with all the airbags and traction control you could dream of. But here's the hard truth, no technology can outsmart physics. The NTSB and Bell's own performance study confirmed the aircraft went deep into its VRS envelope descending faster than the rotors could handle clean airflow. Then came those violent control inputs forward cyclic full aft down collective all within one second. The loads that put on the rotor head and mast were insane. The main rotor blades flexed so far they literally cut through the tail boom striking the tail rotor drive shaft and even an antenna near the engine exhaust. Those strikes left perfect forensic evidence, sharp angled fractures and slice lines that matched the rotor's path exactly. And here's the crazy part, the helicopter was still flyable up to that point. Structurally, mechanically, it was doing everything it was told to do. It's just that the inputs it was told to obey broke it apart. That's the terrifying paradox of modern aviation safety. We've made machines so capable, so forgiving, that sometimes pilots forget how easy it still is to push them beyond their limits. You can have all the automation, all the sensors, but when the physics of airflow turn against you, no warning chime or fail-safe system is going to save you. So what do we take away from this? The NTSB's probable cause says it all. Inappropriate flight control inputs, while in vortex ring state, resulting in main rotor contact with the tail boom and in-flight breakup. Also causal was the instructor's inadequate monitoring of the flight. Pretty technical, right? But what that really means is this, the maneuver itself wasn't the killer. The lack of communication and control discipline was. Because when two experts fail to clarify roles when safety margins get traded for realism, the line between training and tragedy disappears fast. After the crash, Mercy Flight grounded its fleet for safety checks, and later retired the tail number, November 507 Tango Joliet, out of respect for Sauer and Dietrich. Their deaths hit the EMS aviation community hard, not just because of who they were, but because of what it represented. Even the best trained crews can fall victim to complacency disguised as confidence. And that's the real gut punch here. This wasn't a maintenance issue or a freak storm or some mystery malfunction. This was human, painfully human. Two pilots both believing they could control the uncontrollable. Aviation doesn't just test machines, it tests judgment. 
and the moment we forget that experience stops being protection and starts being illusion. Every maneuver, every flight carries a lesson. This one cost two masters their lives, and a reminder to every pilot watching if you're going to flirt with the edge of the envelope, do it in a simulator, not in the sky. If you think simulator-based VRS training should replace real aircraft practice, drop your thoughts below. I'd love to hear what you think.